Would you like to join a conversation with the Freelancer Show panelists and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a form that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. Sign up at freelancershow.com slash form. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 116 of the Freelancer Show. This week on our panel, we have Eric Davis. Hello. Mandy Moore. Hi. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv, and this week we're going to be talking about um, getting ready to go freelance, and in particular, we're going to talk about some of the um, nuances of dealing with the government and, and things like that. So um, there are a few areas of this that, that I can think of, and I know that there are probably some that I haven't thought of, but you know there are certain things like getting your business entity together, paying taxes, which we talked about a little bit last week, you know, getting business licenses, all that kind of fun stuff. And then there are also issues around like labor laws and things like that. Is there any particular area that you guys want to uh, talk about first? Um, I think entity stuff is kind of the most important because depending on what entity you're under, that's going to determine what other stuff you have to do. Yeah. So I, I was going to point out, I, I know that uh, Mandy just set up an LLC for dev reps. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about how that went? It really wasn't hard. All I did was go to my accountant and ask him to do it. And I think it cost me a total of about four or $500. And I got the paperwork and that was that. But I did want to incorporate like that because it keeps you safe legally. If somebody tries to sue you or or whatever, you're, you're protected in that. You know, they can't go after your personal assets, your your house, your car, whatever. So, uh, so that's one benefit of incorporating. So, did you set it up so that you're the sole owner of your LLC? Yes, and right now I'll just I have consultants, and the, so they're sole proprietors, and they'll have to you know fill out W nines for me, and at the end of the year I'll send them. Uh, 1099, then, you know, I'm protected that way. Very nice. How's your setup, Eric? When I got started, I just did a sole proprietorship because it was, it was easy and we didn't have a lot of personal assets to protect. I think two years later, I set up an LLC and it was pretty easy. I actually, in Oregon, all, you can do almost everything electronically. So it was like, I don't know, maybe a hundred, 150 bucks to do the state stuff. And then I bought a kit that came with all the forms and templates to do like, I can't remember what it is for LLC, but it's like bylaws and corporate stuff like that. And mine even came with like a little fancy, like corporate seal, hole punchy type thing. And so I got a binder of all that, but I mean, total cost, I think four or 500 are probably at the high end for me. That hole punchy stuff is official. Yeah, I know. Like I, I grabbed like just random pieces of paper and started like officially signing things with it. <laughs> nice. So when I set up my LLC, I had been working on a joint venture with somebody. And so I just set it up myself. I went to the state, uh, state of Utah. I'm assuming you guys filed in the states that you're, or set your businesses up in the states you're in. Um, yeah. Yep. So yeah, so I set mine up in the state of Utah and you can file the paperwork electronically here as well. So I set up an LLC and I just paid the 80 bucks that it cost to set it up. Didn't know that I needed anything else. Um, I also paid for an EIN, which is an employer identification number. Um, and that means that on my uh, W-9s, I can actually send them a W-9 for the business and give them my EIN. I don't have to give them my social security number. You paid for it? They're supposed to be free. Oh, maybe it was free. I don't remember. Yeah, I think mine was. came with it. But anyway, so I have all that set up. And then I was talking, when I went freelance, I was talking to a friend of mine. He's been on the show before, David Brady. And he referred me to my accountant and my accountant talked me through setting things up so that it changed the ownership a little bit on the LLC so that my wife owned, or we have another family limited partnership, which is uh, just a partnership here in the state of Utah. But uh, anyway, my wife owns 90% of that and I own 10% of it. And then that entity owns 90% of my actual freelance business. It manages the taxes in a particular way, and I'm not an accountant or an attorney, so I can't exactly explain it all to you. But my accountant, yeah, knows it's what just to another level it. of protection. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so it it protects us in certain ways, and it helps with the taxes in certain ways. So I actually have two legal entities between me and anyone who wants to sue me. So besides the legal reasons, what other reasons have you guys heard or experienced for having a business entity? 
I just basically did it to protect myself and my family. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like a good idea because I had no idea what to do. So I just went to an accountant and he helped with my taxes. He helped with everything. And, you know, basically he just does everything for me, which I'm okay with paying for that because when it comes to the wall, you don't really want to mess with that. Yep. I mean, there's really only two reasons. One is like the legal protection. And then the second is taxes. And uh, the taxes only comes into play if you do a corporation or have your LLC or whatever entity you're using get taxed as a corporation. Like my LLC is taxed as a kind of a sole proprietorship. So it goes through onto like what's the schedule C in the US, which basically means I don't pay like a corporate tax. It's just all gets passed through. But really, that's like the only two purposes for an entity. You know, there really isn't anything else to it. It's all just like what other kind of processes and bureaucracies you set up in your, your business itself, which you could do that in a sole proprietorship also. Yep. Now, do you guys have like articles of incorporation and all that fun jazz? Eric, you uh, said that I have all came the LLC kit, version. Right? Yeah, I, I don't remember what it is, but yeah, you, uh, you have to do some of that. Like my state required that when I registered the LLC and then I have, um, I can always remember the corporate ones, like the, the annual meeting and annual minutes, like just kind of showing that I'm doing all of the process, keeping this as a separate entity. And it's not just a, uh, for the legal protection, because if you're, if you only have a corporation or anything for the legal protection, uh, lawyers can kind of get around that because there's no actual real purpose to it and blah, 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 you know, but yeah, like I have the paperwork for it and you can find that online. It's most of that's pretty easy. It's pretty templatable. And especially for freelancers, it's not that complex. Yep. I need to do a little bit better with having the annual meetings and keeping the minutes and all that stuff because, uh, yeah, a lot of it affects uh, how well your LLC will shield you from liability. I actually just got my kit uh, for Oregon. It's called the Articles of Organization, which is, oh. I think that's for all, everything, but that's just like something you file off the state that has like your, your sick code of like what industry you work in, who the owners are, how long it's around, all that. It's like a one page paper, but it's the operating agreement is kind of the, the, the LLC version of the Articles of Incorporation. And it looks like it's about a dozen pages, mostly legal template. Like, you know, these are the owners, this is the managers, all that stuff. Nothing fancy. Yeah. Now, is your business owned solely by you or does your wife own part of it or? It's just me. Yeah. I, Same. I got some indication that like certain groups or certain uh, companies in the government prefer uh, woman owned businesses. And so that and it, it does help with the taxes. The fact that my wife doesn't actually work in the business. I don't have to pay self-employment tax on some of the income from the business because she owns it. And so my wife actually owns the majority of my business. And I, I kind of explained that when I explained the breakdown of things. But I've heard that there are advantages to that, though I haven't seen it. But the tax advantages I mean, are kind of nice. Yeah, it's hard. It's it's like the home office deduction. It's a very slippery slope. You know, you could start getting a lot of help from the government. But I mean, once you get help from them, whether it's in, you know, they're giving you grants or they're giving you money or just not charging you a lot of taxes, then at a certain point, they might want to see this. And if you do like a woman owned business, but she doesn't actually run the business to me, that's a very black gray area. Like that's, you're really pushing it. If it is, if she's actually like managing it, she's bossing you around more than normal and all that, then <laughs> yeah, like normal. it would make sense. I like that. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, there, there's probably advantages for that. And, you know, there's advantages for if you have your, you know, your children are of a certain age and they are kind of not, I don't know if it's employees, but they work with the business and all that, like stuff like that works. But this is like, you've got to run all this by the, uh, your attorney and your lawyer and probably at the same time. Yeah. And for me, I just kept it as I own it. Very simple, very basic. I, I didn't want too much of an overhead. And even if it means I pay a little bit more in taxes, it's just not having to deal with that because this stuff is like you set it up once and you can just walk away from it. Yeah, we, we really haven't done anything to take advantage of her owning most of the business. But, you know, since she, she isn't the one that's, you know, doing most of the work in the business, you know, it saves us a little bit on the self-employment tax. And my accountant knows how all that works. Anyway, do you guys have business licenses for the cities you live in or work in? No. <laughs> <laughs> I used to. We lived in Beaverton, which is, you know, incorporated city. And then we moved. We live in Aloha now, which is kind of... It's an unincorporated area, so it's not technically a city or a town or anything, and so there there is no licensing authority out here. It's more like the county, and our county itself doesn't require licenses or anything like that. But when we lived in Beaverton, I had to have a business license for the city, and I had to have a home occupancy permit to basically say, like, I'm working or I have a business that I run at home. And that was like one-page type paperwork, maybe 
50 or 100 bucks a, a year, nothing big. I've looked into getting one for where I live, but nobody's ever called me on it. And every time I think about it, I think about going down to the city building. I'm just like, eh, I'll do it later. That's something my accountant hasn't even just suggested to me. So unless he sees a reason that I need to do it, then I just haven't done it. I mean, I don't think it matters that much when you're you're working at home and you don't have people coming to your house. The the problem you could be is they might come and slap you with like back payments, interest, all that. Like that's probably the extent of your risk. If you actually had a storefront or something and then someone like hurt themselves and sued you and then it kind of got out that you didn't have a business license, that would be a different story. But if you're working at home or if you're like working at a co-working space, like I don't think it's as big of a deal. I mean, it's obviously, you know, talk to your professional group, but I got it because I wanted to be on the up and up, but I probably didn't need it. Yeah, I want to be on the up and up. I just, it's just something that I don't think about unless I'm talking to you guys about it. Are there any other government type, you know, paperwork that you have to file for some of this stuff? I mean, other than taxes and business license and business entity stuff? Well, I mean, you already talked about the employer identification number, like the EIN, which it's not really technically for just employers. It's, I have it. I've actually gotten two. I had one when I had the sole proprietorship and then when I made the LLC. And basically it's a, it gives you a unique number that you can use instead of your social security number. So if I get hired, like I'm subcontracting for someone, I don't have to give them my social security number for them to send me tax forms. I give them this EIN. I've heard of some clients. I've, I haven't seen them in, in myself, but I've heard of some clients that actually require that. And that's kind of the idea. Like these are big companies that they, they want that to make sure that they're hiring only companies and not just, you know, freelancers or moonlighters. But the EIN, I've done it online. It takes 10 minutes to do. You get it right away. It's like a PDF you get, you can print it out and you're done. It's pretty simple. Yeah. That's why I did it. I didn't want to be handing out my social security number. Yeah. We'll steal your business's uh, identity, I guess. Yeah. Well, when you have like many, many clients that you work on on an ongoing basis, like I do, I bill, you know, 10 or 11, maybe even up to 15 clients every two weeks. So it's 15 people that I'm, you know, giving out my social security number for if they ask me to sign a W-9 and, you know, it's just safer to keep it that way because you, you can steal anybody's identity with a social security number. Yeah, that's true. And, and that's why I do it too. Have you guys hired subcontractors or anything like that? Um, yeah. You know, what's kind of your process for that? When my accountant set me up with my LLC, he actually threw in a template subcontractor agreement. So I only have one subcontractor right now. And when we started working together, I just threw it in for her to sign and so that protects me. I also asked her for a W-9 right away so that, you know, I'm not chasing them down come January or February. I have it on file so I can just take everything when I'm ready to go to my accountant to do my taxes and then he'll take care of the rest. Yeah, that makes sense. Have any of you hired full-time employees? No. No, and I don't really want to. My wife's in HR and I know how they are. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to deal with that yet. My dad owns his own business. He's a dentist here and he's gone through some nightmare things with his dental assistants. Um, mm -hmm. he's fired three or four in the last few years and, uh, you know, either for not being competent, not being honest or both. Um, one of them actually, she got like, I want to say it's like 40 something counts of fraud because she falsified her timesheets. Gosh. And, um, you know, I mean, some of this stuff you can, you can deal with in the business, but th the issue is, is that he's still, he's paying unemployment for all of those, you know, all, all three of those people, even though he has documented the process of working with them and trying to get them up to snuff and letting them go. He's paying unemployment on the girl who actually defrauded him out of money on her paychecks. And, uh, you know, that kind of stuff really scares me away from it a little bit because you, you have to pay benefits. Um, Obamacare got a little more stringent on that. And then you have to pay unemployment and you have to pay unemployment insurance, even if you've never actually had to pay unemployment. And then you, you've got to pay for all these other things and they wind up costing a lot more than somebody that's just, you know, their hourly. I mean, you have to pay them a little bit higher hourly rate to offset some of those benefits. But in the end, if it doesn't work out, it's a contract deal. And so when you let them go, the contract's over. There's no unemployment. You know, there's no wrangling over this or that. You just fulfill the terms of the contract and you're done. 
to me, that's kind of a government thing because, you know, it does vary from state to state, but it's something to be concerned about and know about if you're looking at going down the road of hiring people. Well, the other thing to think about, too, is it's not just all the stuff you need around them, but if you have an employee and they're not doing anything, like say you hire someone to do design work for you, like you're a design shop or an agency, if you don't bring in whatever, 20, 30, 40, hundred thousand dollars in new work for them to do each month, they're sitting there on their hands and knees well, on their hands, I guess, just costing you money and not actually making anything for you. So you have this, it becomes like a fixed cost type thing. Yeah. Where I, I can see though, that if you are bringing in, you know, if you can consistently bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work for them to do every month and they can churn it out and you're paying them, you know, a hundred, you know, between their benefits and everything else, you're paying a hundred thousand dollars. I can see that as a, you know, as a possible win. And provided they're a good employee, that you're not going to need to, you know, hassle with some of the stuff that my dad's had to deal with. Yeah, it's not so much it's like a win or a loss. It's that it's a commitment, and yeah. the okay. commitment kind of the understanding is that you're going to be within this range of you have a certain amount of work for them and you have a certain amount of extra fees like unemployment. And if you, your prediction or your thing is outside of that range, whether on the high end or low end, things get screwed up. And so like this, is what I tell my clients this a lot, like with freelancers or contractors or consultants, like if you, like the client doesn't have work to do, you don't have to pay me to work on yourself. I go work with someone else. And so you're not paying for an activity. You're not having to worry about that. And it's, it's, it's flexibility that they get instead of actually having someone that they're committed to full time for the next, you know, X amount of years. Yeah, that's definitely a selling point. And that's, that's the reason why over the last few years, when I do hire people, they're, they're contractors. I mean, you know, it's, it's the same kind of situation with Mandy when she does work for me. It's, I have no obligation to her beyond paying her for the work she does. Does that make sense? Yeah. Not to say that we're not friends, but that's a different thing. That's kind of one of the arrangements that I really, I really like, but the flip side is, is that, you know, they don't have, there, there seems to be a little bit of loyalty expectation between subcontractors and employees, uh, you know, when, when an employee is working for you. And so, you know, they kind of expect you to keep them around and you expect them to stick around. And so I think one of the other downsides of hiring contractors is sometimes there is something shinier that they'll go and, and find and do. But if you're concerned about that, you can build that into the contract too. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of the commitment aspect. I mean, if there's no commitment there, then it works both ways. It's, you know, yeah. they can go off and do something or they can be busy. But it's it's more of like you just need to be aware of it. So taxes, we talked a little bit about taxes last time as far as like saving up for it and being aware you have to pay it. What legal aspects of that do we need to talk about when we're talking about government and being ready to go freelance? Um, pay, just set up a direct them. deposit. So all of your invoices get paid to the IRS and then they'll send you a little bit at the end of the year. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you got to pay it. You have to file just the way I understand it. April 15th is the deadline. You can file an extension, then you can file before August 15th. That doesn't keep them from charging you fees or penalties for paying late, and they want their money by the 15th of April as well. I got nailed last year for not paying quarterly, but so now my accountant has me set up where every quarter I have 15 days to send them a check of estimated quarterly taxes, and then I can do it that way instead of yearly. So you're not just sending like a big chunk. You're sending four chunks out of the year, which makes it a little bit nice too. Yeah, and you get you get dealt a penalty if you don't pay quarterly as well. And yeah. a lot of business people I know, they just take the penalty and pay it once a year. Uh, so it's it, it sounds almost like a preferential thing. You know, you can do it one way or the other way. But yeah. Um, it's not that much. It was only like $250, but still it's $250. So yeah, I, I mean, you know, there are those deals. The other few things that I know about taxes are that you can't bankrupt back taxes. So if you get into financial straits and you file for bankruptcy, you can't get rid of them that way. And, you know, they can go and get liens on your house and your they can get it taken out of your bank account if you do have money in there and all that fun stuff. So you're probably better off just paying the government and making them happy. Anything else on taxes that you guys want to tackle? This has nothing to do with taxes, but um, recently, since I just went into business the past year, um, and I only have like about a year and a half of 
tax summaries. Uh, I'm trying to buy a house and I can't do that until I have another year's worth of uh, tax summaries to show banks because they want two years at least of that kind of stuff. So that's another reason that you want to, you know, do your taxes and pay them so that when you do go to get a loan for like something like a house or a car, that you have something to show them because I'm still, I'm still stuck in that. I have to rent for another year. Right. Yeah. I, I ran into that when we tried to refinance one of the houses that we own. And the nice thing was that the loan officer, I've known her for like 15 years, well, longer than that, almost 20 years. And so she pulled a lot of strings to make things happen for me, but it, it was still a, a tricky deal to make go through. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping that the person that I'm working with to buy the house that I really really want is actually working with. I'm working with his bank now, and they they are talking about that there there might be some things that they can do to help speed the process along. But if you just go and and talk to somebody who doesn't know you they're going to be a lot less likely to approve you or even help you get approved if you don't have all those records. Yeah, you got to find people who either are creative or they know their stuff. I don't remember the name of it right now, but you can find some loans where, I think it's called like a no-doc, where if you basically give them your word, like, I make this much. And, you know, the more paperwork you can give them, the better, but they don't have like a hard requirement of, you know, two years of tax statements for businesses or six months of pay stubs for an employee um, the problem is, you know, you pay a lot in upfront fees and then you also will pay more in interest, but to kind of get you into something like, I mean, if your business is throwing off of, you know, six figures, seven figures a year easily in profit, you know, you could almost buy a house with cash, but, you know, getting a loan's a bit better. And so it's the idea of you can get into that and you have the cash to kind of pay for things. And it's just, a, it's just a way to work around the system. But banking's gotten kind of weird years since the economy kind of went belly up a while back. So there's a lot of rules changing and a lot of people I know are going out of business or getting out of banking and especially real estate stuff just because it's it's getting hard. Yeah. And those no doc loans are getting harder and harder to get to because I've heard people blaming at least some of the downturn on that. And so a lot of the banks pulled back on being as liberal with them. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, it's, it's any kind of loan. The bank or whoever's giving you the money, they just, they want documentation. They want to know that the money they're giving you is not going to be at risk. And so the happier you make them feel, the better. And that's why employees can kind of get a loan a bit better because having a, a job is seem, seems a lot more secure to banks. Um, at least the people who are underwriting and all that versus if you're doing freelance stuff, like it's, it's a pain. We got our house and I was freelancing for it. I think just over two years at the time and I knew I knew real estate from a past life so it was pretty easy for us and I I overwhelmed them with documentation about finances and stuff like that and so it was pretty easy for us um, this was also when money was a lot more available and easy to get you know but it's it's you want them to feel comfortable you want to take as much risk away from the banks or whoever it is and that that helps and that kind of advice works for clients too when you're trying to land projects yeah definitely so are there any other legalities you guys can think of? One that comes to mind is if you actually do business out of somewhere other than your home, you have to carry insurance on the premises. So for example, my dad, again, going back to his dental practice, right now he's in a complex where the complex covers that kind of uh, insurance. But uh, his previous office, he had to pay for insurance so that if somebody you know got hurt in the parking lot or you know walking into his office or something, you know, he was covered that way because he didn't, he, you know, it's not like at your house where you have homeowner's insurance to cover that kind of stuff. Yeah. But the thing is your homeowner's insurance might not cover business stuff. And it might like if your house catches on fire and you know you have a home office, there's a good chance that your insurance policy won't pay to replace business equipment. And you have to, to look at that and talk to them about that. I think we got like an extra rider on ours or something. So it's not just liability side, but also like equipment replacement, that sort of thing. Yeah, in a lot of cases, rental insurance will cover that if you rent your own. Yeah, I don't know. You'd have to talk to your insurance professional because I think it varies from state to state, policy to policy. Yeah, it's a policy to policy thing. Like in some places, like they just they won't cover floods or whatever, but in others, it's like, yeah, it never floods up here, so we'll cover it. And another one that I see people on both sides of the fence is errors and emissions insurance, which is kind of the professional equivalent of I screwed up, sorry type insurance. And that, depending on what kind of projects you work on and what work you, you do, uh, that's kind of, that could be important or it could just be a waste of money. 
I mean, I think we had a show on insurance. We can probably put in the show notes, but you know, you just got to look at what risk your business has. And if there's risk of you like destroying an entire 20 gigabyte database on a production server, you know, maybe having errors and emissions might be kind of a good safety net to have. Yeah. I've also had clients that have required have, or have asked for it anyway. Um, and I've, you know, I just struck it out of the language in the contract and got their okay on it, but. It was standard procedure for them to ask the businesses they worked with to cover or to carry that kind of insurance. Are there any other things you guys can think of that are part of government stuff? There's one more. Um, depending on how you do it, it might be important or not. But I started out, I was little stream software as a sole proprietorship. So I had to do, uh, I always say DBA. It's a DBA in California. It's an assumed business name or ABN in Oregon. I always call it a DBA because that's what I learned. Um, but I had to get one of those to basically say, like, okay, my name's Eric Davis, but my business operates under a different name. And so it's kind of a, a link between the two and it costs, I think, 40 or 50 bucks a year in Oregon. So it's not too much. And then when I started the LLC, it's Little Stream Software LLC, but I wanted to keep the original name I had just because I'm weird about it. And so I actually had to get a second ABN for that. But if you create an entity and you have used that entity's name, and it could even be your name, like you don't need it. But if you do want to have something different or you want kind of flexibility of like, well, I started it called Spacely Sprockets, but I want it to be called something else now. You can use DBAs or ABNs or whatever it is in your state to kind of change the name without actually going through the legal process of setting something up new or changing it there. And so it's, it's typically a small yearly fee and you just kind of fill out some paperwork saying like, this is who owns it, this is what it is, that sort of thing. Yeah, I've considered doing that for some of the things that I do because I have devchat.tv, which is the podcast's and then I have, you know, the consulting stuff. And then I have some other products that I'm working on right now, you know, so I'm considering setting them up for those different things. And then just then what what it would allow me to do is I would actually go and set up bank accounts for the different entities. And that way I can I can keep different ledgers for each one and things like that. Yeah, it's more of a organization and then branding type of thing. It's not required. And I, I actually recommend freelancers get started. Like if you're going to do sole proprietor and just work under your name, you know, add whatever it is to the end of your name and that's your business name. Just because the amount of paperwork and cost is so low for that versus setting up a corporation and setting up a DBA and all that. And a lot of times when people get started, they don't understand, like it might be a while before you get another, a new client and get an actual enough money to kind of do this. And you know, spending all the time setting up all this stuff before you get started is kind of a form of procrastination and you might not actually get to the actual stuff you're trying to do. So one final thing that I want to say, and I we should probably should have said this at the top of the show, but we're not lawyers, we're not accountants, you know, we're professionals that own businesses. We don't even so. play them on TV. Nope. So, uh, <laughs> you know, if this uh, triggers any questions or concerns for you, then go talk to a professional who deals in these areas and find out what they recommend. And the best way that I found to do that is to talk to somebody else who's already in business, find somebody who's deliriously happy with their person, with their accountant or attorney, and then go talk to that accountant or attorney. Yeah, and this is also very US centric. Yes. Because obviously laws are US centric. I mean, you know, some of them all go back to like the same similar laws, but the actual court cases and all that stuff is different in each country and different in each state and even different in each locality. So yeah, if you can find a local entrepreneur or freelancers doing this stuff that you trust, talk to them. They might, they might even have professionals they hate. They can kind of tell you, oh yeah, like don't forget to do this. Don't forget to pay quarterly taxes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also a lot of places, I don't, there's something that I went to and it was free. It's called SCORE. There's over 320 chapters throughout the United States. So if you can find one of them, go find one and talk to somebody because they'll, they'll point you in the right direction of accountants, lawyers. And then they also, a lot of time, they hold roundtable business meetings every month and you can just pay $10 and show up. And there's a bunch of entrepreneurs in one room and you just sit around a table and basically it's like a in-person mastermind group. And I've gone to about three or four of those and I have gotten so much out of it. Sometimes I'll even have food. So it's a nice little free lunch if you want to show up and I mean, you pay ten dollars, so I guess it's not free. But you you meet like minded individuals in your city that you can just hang out with and talk to for an hour, an hour and a half, and they become good networking partners as well. Oh, very nice. They even have a chapter where I met. Yeah, it's really beneficial. I've gotten a lot of a lot of good business advice, and uh, they hold classes. 
there, there's more than just the little round tables. Like they'll have actual classes that is like, you know, one night a week for a month and it's for a fi- over a five week period. And you can just go and show up and, and ask all the questions you want to whoever the host is. It's kind of like a little meetup kind of thing. And it's really, really cool. So if you have one of those in your area, I would definitely check one out. Cool. All right. Well, it sounds like we're kind of heading toward picks. Anything else we ought to cover before we get there? Just make sure you do everything by the books. like, And you don't try to say, well, nobody's asked me for a W-9, so I'm just going to let it go. Because it will catch up with you. And you just want to do everything by the books and do your taxes, get the proper licenses, talk to the right people. I know it seems scary at first, but overall it's for the best. And then you feel really good after it's all done because I'm one of those kind of people. I was petrified to go talk to somebody once I figured out what I was doing and that I needed to do something. But I cannot stress to you enough how good you feel after you go and you're like, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. That wasn't so scary. Just go do it. Yeah. All right. Well, let's do the picks. Eric, do you have some picks for us? Yeah. So my pick is Corp USA. It's basically where I got my LLC kit. I think I got the high end because it's like the price is, it's just worth it. But, you know, it's a binder, has a lot of the templates and forms you need. I got the little, it's like a hole punch seal thing. I even got official looking, not stock certificates. I can't remember what LLC calls it, but, you know, stock certificate type things with all these little loopy drawings and stuff. So if you have someone or you do it yourself and do the incorporation or whatever, getting this would kind of be a good idea just to have all of the stuff you need because it, it gives you good templates and, that kind of makes sure that, you know, you're like what Manny said, you're always kind of doing stuff by the book. You have it all in there. It's all organized, you know, and I, I, I pull it off the shelf quite often because I'll need my EIN number, which I put in there and stuff like that. Awesome. Mandy, what are your picks? I am going to pick Oyster. It's basically the Netflix of books and it is awesome. The first of all, you sign up and you get one month for free. And then after that, it's nine ninety nine a month. And you get to read all the books you can read, which is great for somebody like me who will, no lie, go through two or three big books a week. And there's some great titles in there. Uh, not all the titles that you can ever imagine. Um, a lot of times the like, new books that come out, they're not there right away, which is kind of the same deal with Netflix. But you can go through and just mark a bunch of books as ones that you think are going to be interesting or right up your alley and give them a star. And then once you finish a book, go through that list and be like, yep, I'm in the mood for a good memoir and pick one of those out. I read a book every night before I go to sleep and I can't say enough good things about Oyster. So if you want to try it out, I have an affiliate link in the pick section. It'd be cool if you click on it. So that's what I got. So are they ebooks or audiobooks or? They're ebooks. It's just an app you download on your phone and it's called Oyster and you sign in just like Netflix and you can put on your iPad, your iPhone, probably even your Mac. I don't read on my computer. I just read on my phone or my iPad, but it's just awesome. I just can't say enough good things about it. I've already read a book about Pat Benatar, which is really interesting. Um, a couple of other, I'm really big into memoirs, so that's kind of my thing. A lot of rock history, but then they, my, my fiance, we can actually share an account and he's reading all the J.R.R. Tolkien books right now, rereading all the Lord of the Rings books, which are on there. And he's absolutely loving it. So we sit in bed and in the dark and read off of the iPad and the phone and it's great. Very nice. All right. Well, it's been kind of a hectic week for me and I don't know if I have any picks. I'm just going to pile on to Mandy's pick a little bit and, you know, mention Audible, which is kind of my preferred way of doing things. So when I'm out running errands or mowing the lawn or whatever, I'll turn on an audio book and listen to that. And I'm, I'm really an audio guy. I listen to podcasts all the time. And so audio books are just kind of another way to do that. And they have some pretty good business books and stuff. In fact, uh, one or two of the book club books I actually listen to instead of reading. And uh, they've been pretty darn good so i guess i'll make that my pick and uh, we'll wrap up hosting and bandwidth provided by the blue box group check them out at bluebox.net bandwidth for this segment is provided by cashfly the world's fastest cdn 
Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.